good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for getting up early and coming to the first keynote of the day. So Mark Andreessen, who is the co-author of Mosaic, and he's now a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz in Silicon Valley, which is one of the most successful um, VC firms in Silicon Valley, famously said that software is eating the world. And what he meant by that is that entire industries were being consumed, uh, often industries that had a large footprint in the physical world, were being consumed by software companies. So you had Netflix was replacing Blockbuster, you had iTunes and Spotify were replacing physical music stores, and so on. However, the software business itself tends to be quite insular, so it exports all its ideas, you know, it takes over other industries, but it doesn't really absorb a whole lot from the outside. So my question this morning is, if software is eating the world, then what should the software world be eating? Um, so my name is Kira Byrne, and I'm a technology journalist. Um, and I'm going to give you a very personal selection of five things that I think software should be eating, um, based on stuff that I have written over the past few years. So the first thing on my list is what I call humanification. So not how code works, but how people work, physically, mentally, and emotionally, and how we can use that knowledge that comes from other areas like psychology or sociology or physiology in order to make better technology products that actually serve human beings better. So traditionally, we've actually had to adapt to technology, not the other way around. So since the Industrial Revolution, for example, you know, people moved from the countryside into the cities and went to work in factories. And if you were working in a, you know, a cotton mill in, in the UK in the mid-19th century, the human beings in that mill actually served the machines rather than the other way around. And it was dangerous work, um, and it was difficult work. And then later on, we had things like typewriters and then eventually personal computers, so we all had to learn how to type. Um, so again, this is not our normal way of interfacing with other people. Uh, so I was a software developer for many years, so that meant that I spent most of my time, you know, 10, 12 hours a day sitting in front of a, a screen and typing, typing in commands. Um, and later on, I actually learned how to teach yoga, and I've taught, taught quite a few uh, entrepreneurs and developers like myself. And I've seen the damage that that can do actually to the body, because the human body was not designed to sit for 10 hours a day doing this. So one of the things that we need to do, I think, so we've had a movement in the last few years towards more human technology with things like touch screens and gesture technology so you can control things by doing stuff like this. But I think we really need more radically human technology so that we're not um, going against our own physical, you know, normal physical way of doing things or our normal emotional way of doing things in order to be able to use a piece of technology. So a couple of years ago, I interviewed um, a Swedish entrepreneur who actually makes, uh, his company makes amazing interfaces for mobile. Um, but he was complaining that most of his status updates on Facebook were actually from things like Runkeeper and Foursquare. So he said he was communicating with his friends using things like GPS coordinates and the number of kilometers he had run today and, you know, the, the names of the tracks that he had listened to on Spotify. And he said, like, this is... We're, we're adapting the way we interact with each other in order to fit in with the, this technology rather than the other way around. So what he said we should be doing is using the human APIs, what he called the human APIs, which means things like voice and movement and emotion and touch. And this is the interface that we should be using to technology and also to, because that's the way we interact with other people and with the world in general. So if you think about those human APIs, babies are more restricted from that point of view because they don't have language yet. So this is a product called the MIMO Baby Monitor, and it has integrated sensors. So that baby girl has integrated sensors which uh, sense the temperature, uh, the respiration, the body position, the activity level, and actually that little turtle thing is also a transmitter so it can stream sound. So what's interesting about this is that it is integrated into clothing. So we all wear clothing every day anyway, so this is not an extra thing that we clamp onto ourselves, which is actually very ugly a lot of the time. So this is the stage we're at with wearables at the moment. 
It's actually part of our existing world, and that's what hum really human technology should be. It should be in the background. We shouldn't have to change the way that we do things in order to use it. It should adapt to the way we do things. So if we move from the physical to the emotional, this is a company called Magisto, and what they do is they use very sophisticated computer vision, speech analysis, music analysis, and machine learning in order to be able to automatically edit mobile videos. So you can take some footage that's on your mobile phone and it will, you'll say, okay, I want to edit it down to uh, one minute and what kind of mood you want to create and then it will do it for you automatically. So you might think, okay, but like, what does this have to do with emotion? The reason that this is an emotional, that these are emotional algorithms is because the editing is actually what creates the emotion in a, in a, in a video. So it's not in the original footage. So what a human editor will do is he'll pick particular shots and cuts and will edit them together in a particular way, choose music, set the pace, you know, put dialogue in the foreground or the background, or so on, in order to create a particular mood. And it's that mood which, which evokes the emotion from the person who is reading, or sorry, watching the video. So what this is really doing is allowing people, all of this sophisticated technology which is underneath, under the hood, right, the users can't see it, the purpose of it is to allow you to show how you felt when you recorded that video. So if you were recording a video of your kids or it's a video of your wedding or whatever, how you, the mood which you choose for the editing basically allows you to show how it felt. So you're using the sophisticated technology in order to express emotion to another human being. So the next one on my list is actually another one of the human APIs. Uh, sound, which I think is very underused in the software world. So before the advent of the web, um, most developers had never worked with a visual designer. Uh, and that was still the case maybe up to, in, some kind, in some teams, probably up to fairly recently. Uh, whereas, let's say in games, audio and music is used in every single game out there. But why is the rest of software so silent? So I talked to a group of sound designers and composers who work in games. Uh, so they work on things from uh, Minecraft to uh, big electronic arts games like Battlefield. And I asked them basically for their tips on how people could use uh, sound in their own you know, mobile apps or in other pieces of software. So they explained to me that you could use sound in order to make your application more enjoyable, more efficient, and actually more addictive. So here are some of the simplest ways you can use sound. So probably all of you know the Intel Inside sound, so it's the do, 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 do. So this is an audio logo, and it's probably one of the most successful audio logos of all time. So this is a product which is invisible. It's actually embedded inside in the device that you were using, but you know it's Intel Inside because you hear that sound. So the most, one of the easiest and the most powerful ways you can use sound in software is making your own audio logo. So when you get uh, an incoming message from WhatsApp or Skype or you have various other kinds of notifications, you know immediately what that is when you hear that sound. And not only that, but the people around you who hear that sound know what applications you're using. So not only is this a form of branding, it's also a form of advertising and it's actually quite simple to do. So one of the other main ways that game designers use sound is information flow. So how to communicate information with the people who are using the game. So for example, in the original Super Mario games, the, the music used to speed up as you were running out of time. So instead of giving you visual information on you know, the fact that you were running out of time, or you would combine it with the audio to basically make that information transmission clearer and more efficient. And then the other way they suggested that's an easy way of using sound in an application is rewards. So every game usually will have a particular sound which you hear when you have managed to get to the next level or when you have achieved something within the game. And if you get used to playing the game, then you kind of get conditioned to want to hear that sound. So you're completing the task almost so you can hear the sound. So what they suggested was you could also use this in other types of software. And in particular, in, if you're trying to encourage users to do a task that maybe they don't want to do, so maybe you're, you have something like, I don't know, an expenses claim, uh, 
application, so people have to fill in their expenses, which they're not usually keen to do. So if you associate a kind of reward sound when they complete that task, that can actually help them to encourage people to complete it because they will complete the task because they want to hear the sound. The next one is on my list is what I call value-sensitive design. So this is really bringing ethics into the design of software. So techies tend to believe that technology is always a force for good, or at worst, it's neutral. And of course, this is not true at all. Um, because when you design any system, whether it's a social system, a social network, or a software system, you are making decisions which reflect your underlying values and your material interests. But mo this is something that most developers never think about. So if you decide you are going to, for example, store a particular piece of data about your users, and maybe you combine it with some other piece of personal data about your users, that's not only a technical decision, but it could also be a moral decision. So what I mean by value-sensitive design is like figuring out what your system of ethics is when you are designing your piece of software, and at worst, making sure that you're not doing any harm to your users. So Richard Stallman, who is one of the originators of the free software movement, which later led to the open source movement, he calls uh, Facebook users, for example, not users, but useds. So he says they're being exploited by Facebook because Facebook extracts as much information from you as it can, it, which, and you have no control over how that data is monetized. And there are actually a lot of data-driven companies, including people like Google, who actively exploit the fact that we undervalue our own personal data because we don't know what it's worth yet. However, there are some companies out there that are trying to bring, use a moral compass when they, when they build technology. So this is the Fairphone, and it's an Android phone, and it's also the world's first fair trade phone. Uh, it was developed in Amsterdam, where I'm based. So it, you, it does things like it uses, uh, it only uses rare metals from conflict-free zones. So there are actually wars going on in certain parts of the world so that you know, the, these rare metals that are used in mobile phones can be dug up and used in your new iPhone. Um, the, the workers who make it are taken care of, and you have all the other stuff that's associated with fair trade, but which is, just does not exist, more or less, in the technology world. So we take that as standard in things like food, or coffee, or whatever, but it really doesn't exist in, in um, technology. And the great thing about this phone is that you can't actually get one. And the reason for that is because the first batch sold out immediately. And they're in the process of making the second batch. So what this shows is this kind of using ethics as part of your software company is not only, you know, I suppose, morally rewarding, but it can also actually be good for business. The next one is what I call model view culture. So not only does the software business export its products and its ideas to the rest of the world, so we were just talking about Lean Startup, for example, which comes from agile development turned into Lean Startup, which is now used by industries all over the world. Um, but not only have we exported products and ideas, but we've also exported the culture of the tech startup. Uh, Shanley Kane is an author, and uh, she worked in several companies in Silicon Valley, startups in Silicon Valley as a product manager. But when she was in university before this, she had actually taken some courses in things like cultural studies and studies of representation. And these are ways of analyzing culture. So they give you tools and techniques for analyzing popular culture or the culture of a group of people. Um, and I did an article with her, she, and she used this basically to critique startup culture. So I interviewed her a while ago for an article called Why Your Startup's Culture is Secretly Awful. And um, one of the things she said was that culture is made up primarily of things that no one will say. So what this means is that in every development team, in every startup company, in fact, in every group of human beings, they have a submerged set of values and beliefs, priorities and power struggles, myths with her heroes and villains, and then uh, punishments and rewards. But although we are absolutely obsessed in the tech business with measuring and analyzing everything, and we use actually the culture, startups use their culture as a selling point, but we don't analyze it at all. So one of the things on that list that we really have a problem with in the startup world is power. And the reason for that is because 
So startups are kind of notorious for wanting to eliminate all kinds of hierarchies, partly because they define themselves in opposition to big traditional corporates which, who have formal hierarchies with lots of levels of management and all this kind of thing. So Google, for example, eliminated all managers in the early days before bringing them back because they realized they actually needed them. Um, GitHub has a system called open allocation where people decide which projects they're going to work on themselves and they don't have a, traditional manage, a, a manager in the traditional sense. But the problem with this is that power is a, an aspect of every human interaction. So it doesn't matter whether you have traditional managers or not. And if you have eliminated your formal power hierarchy, so nobody knows anymore really how, where the authority is or how power is supposed to be working within a group of people, that means you actually have to be more vigilant rather than less vigilant for abuse. So a good example of this was, again, GitHub, which every developer in this room will probably use. Uh, it's one of the most successful companies in the, in the development world. Um, so they had a PR debacle recently because they had a female developer, a prominent female developer who left basically accusing the company of sexism. But one of the things she also said was that uh, the wife of one of the founders had been kind of bullying and harassing her even though the wife didn't actually work for the company, and this was kind of on the behalf of her husband. So this is a, a perfect example of power operating, but not through a formal structure and being all the more destructive for that reason. So GitHub has had an awful lot of trouble since all this stuff came out. And then the final thing on my list is what I call thick value. Um, so thick value products are products which make users truly better off, which means it improves their health, uh, physical or mental, it improves their social relationships, or it improves their economic status in a measurable way. And the, this phrase, thick value, comes from this book called The New Capitalist Manifesto, which came out a few years ago. Um, and the author explained to me that thin value, so these are, I suppose, concepts from economics. So he explained that thin value is where you transfer value from one party to another. So if you make something for $8 and you sell it for $10, then you make $2 profit. But if the losses to other people in society, so maybe the workers who made the thing for $8, or the environment if you're using lots of um, you know, raw materials or whatever, is more than $2, that means you are not creating any authentic value. So you, have, you still have your $2, but you haven't actually created real value. And that's what he calls thick value. Or the other definition of thick value is if you make a profit of $2, but the benefit that you're giving to your users is not actually worth $2, then also you have failed to create any authentic value. And this brings up the idea of use value versus exchange value. So use value is how useful something actually is, and exchange value is how much money you can get from it. So the tech business, especially actually some of the most hyped companies in the tech business, sometimes have a bit of a problem with this. So their use value maybe isn't that high, but their exchange value is very high for the founders and for the investors. And that's how those companies come to have huge valuations and so on. So I've been complaining about this for quite a while. Um, but I decided, re so I decided, but I know it's really difficult to actually build any new business, right? It's really, really difficult. And I know because I'm a freelance journalist, which is basically being the CEO of myself in a dying industry. So. Um, without having to consider like all these kind of moral issues and thick value versus thin value and all this kind of business. So I decided to stop complaining about it and try and do something about it. So last week I got selected for this, this program called Significance Labs. And what they're going to do is there's 25 million people in the US who live in households that earn less than $25,000 a year. So that's about 18,000 euros. So we're talking 75 million people who earn less than this level. And what we're going to try and do at Significance Labs is basically build five tech products, so there's five people that are going to do this, um, which can make their life a little bit easier. And this is not going to be easy, and maybe we won't be able to do it, but I think if we can do it, then that's something that's going to have real use value. Because we don't need better selfies, we need technology to make the world a better place. All right, so thank you very much. That's my first presentation. You're getting two for the price of one today. So we'll switch to the next one. What about applause?
You should get a higher dose of coffee because uh, if you, in case you're still sleeping, so. Guarana. Or guarana, yeah. I drank three guaranas yesterday. Uh, yeah, for me, for me it working, you know. Okay. Uh, it was full moon yesterday, so I didn't sleep till like four o'clock. So I don't know it was or it was guarana or full moon, but uh, you can try it. So, Kiara, go ahead. All right, so while the last presentation was quite high level, abstract ideas, you know, kind of make, you might take one idea out of it that you'll think about a bit more later. This one is very practical and very down to earth. So probably for a lot of you in the audience who, who work in a startup, this whole um, how the press works is probably a complete mystery because it certainly was to me before I started working in it. Uh, so I'm gonna give you some basic tips on how to pitch your product and your startup to the tech press. And this applies not just to the tech press, I think, but to pretty much any, any form of press, any journalists. So the first thing, and I think actually that most startups don't consider this enough, is why do you want press in the first place? So startups tend to think of press and you know, investment as always being good things, right? The more the better. And uh, it's not true. It should really be the amount of effort you have to put into it and the amount of benefit you get out of it is, is in balance, that you get more benefit than the effort you put into it. And in order to get press, you will have to put effort into it. You're either gonna to have to spend money or you're gonna have to spend time, which is the same thing. So some of the typical um, reasons that you get from startups about why they want press is things like nobody's using the product. But as Shira pointed out today, yesterday, you know, the thing that's going to kill a bad product quickest is good marketing. So if you get a lot of press and you don't have a good product, then that's going to kill you completely. But also journalists don't want to write about a product that isn't really that interesting. The other one is we want to do a launch, right? And again, companies are not often very clear about why they're launching something or like what, what kind of launch is this? Um, and launches are often associated with vanity metrics which are not real metrics for your business. So if you're not getting new customers out of it or you have a new investor or, or whatever, then okay, you got a lot of hits on your website, but that's a vanity metric. It's not a real metric most of the time. The worst reason, and this is the one that I get most often, is our peers are on TechCrunch or our peers are on whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is that your business is doing well. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is better reasons for, for getting press or trying to get press. So maybe you want more leads, maybe you want to make more sales, maybe you're looking for new investors, maybe you're looking for new developers, so you need more applications for jobs, or maybe you need new partners, distribution partners or other kind of partners. So you should be fairly clear when you start to try and get media coverage, which one of these is the most important to you, and there may be a couple of different ones, but the way that you pitch to the press and also what kind of press you approach is dependent on which of these objectives you're trying to achieve. So you should be pretty clear about it. The next one is what kind of press. So the other thing startups tend to think is that all press is the same. Um, but there are different categories. And depending on what your objective is, you're going to want to target one category more than the other. So there's the tech press, which is people like TechCrunch and VentureBeat and the next web, you know, the kind of stuff, people that I write for. Then there's the business press, which could be, well, Forbes is technology and business, but, or it could be the Wall Street Journal, or it could be whatever. There's the trade press, which is actually really, really important a lot of the time when you're trying to get new customers. So to give you an example, I did a story on a, on a company called Tree Metrics, which is from Ireland, and it was started by a forester. Um, and traditionally, the way that you actually measure how much wood you have in your forest, so in other words, how much stock you have, is that you send a guy out with a pincer and he goes to a couple of trees and he measures a few trees and then they extrapolate from that how much, how much wood basically, how much lumber they have in their forest and obviously this isn't very accurate. So what he did was he took 3D um, scanner out into the forest and then he was able to scan all the trees for several hundred meters and they could take a much more accurate, they had a much more accurate picture of what trees they actually had and also things like how straight the tree is um, is very important for the value of the wood and so on. So I wrote about this in um, VentureBeat at the time, uh, which is great, but there actually aren't a lot of foresters that read VentureBeat, I have to say. It's a very underserved population when it comes to the tech press. So they were selling to foresters, 
right? They're trying to sell this thing to other foresters and they're not going to read VentureBeat. They're going to read like Foresters Monthly or whatever the trade press is for Foresters. I don't know what it is. So if you have a business which is quite niche and where you're trying to sell to, I don't know, you have a system for improving ordering in, in fast food restaurants, then you need to be in the magazines that people who run fast food restaurants actually read. You don't want to be in TechCrunch because that's not actually any use to you when you're trying to get new customers. And then the final one is local press. So again, depending on the type of company you have. So there was a startup in Amsterdam that uh, took local chefs and had them cook food at home and then have it delivered to you. So this is obviously a very local business. You need to roll it out in every city and therefore you need media coverage in that city, in the local language and so on. So again, being on TechCrunch is no use to you if you want to sell to me in Amsterdam because I'm trying to figure out what I want to have for dinner this evening. Then I'm going to give you a short introduction to the psychology of the tech journalist because this can help you a lot when, it's try when it's, you're trying to deal with these people. Um, but I think it pretty, much, it pretty much applies to all journalists. Number one, we are lazy. So what that means really is that we're very busy. Um, so what happens with a lot of startups is they try to explain to you what they do and you don't, like, you can't understand what they do in, you know, two minutes. And most journalists do not have the time to try and drag the story out of you of what it is you actually do and why it's important. So you have to make it as easy as possible for them to write about you. So that means you have to have a very clear story, not only about what your product is, but why it's relevant to the larger industry, why, why is it important, why is it different, and you also need to produce, ideally, a, a press pack for them, which, again, makes life really easy. So for a lot of publications, they have to find an image to go with every story. So if you give them some nice images already, then they, that's one less job they have to do, which makes it easier to cover the story. And if it's easier to cover the story, they're more likely that it's, they're going to cover the story. Or another way of, of helping out a journalist is um, some of the lowest amount of work articles are infographics. So if you have a nice infographic, you just add a couple of points about it, and then you're done. So it's very quick, but it can be, contain very useful information for your audience. So your return on investment as a journalist, based on the amount of time you put into actually writing this thing versus the number of page views you get, is actually very good. So really useful information in a very nice infographic, or making a really funny video, which we actually want to feature on the site because we know a lot of people will watch it, that kind of thing can really help to get you coverage because it's tapping into the fact that we're lazy. Um, next one, journalists are vain. So what that means is every writer wants to be read. And the problem with unknown startups generally is that they don't get page views. So unless you are doing something really novel, really exciting, uh, really science fiction, then generally an unknown startup is not going to get page views. And what you have to think about is in your normal course of business, you're competing with other companies in your niche. So other companies who make a similar product. But when you're trying to get press coverage, you are competing with every other tech company on the planet. Because I could write about something from Apple or Facebook or, or Google today, and I know people are going to read that because it's got Apple or Facebook or Google in the title. Whereas if I write about your unknown startup, I'm probably not going to get any page views at all. So this, when a journalist writes about a company, it's, it's a, an exchange, it's a relationship, right? So you need to give me a story that's going to give, get me page views and then I will write about you. That's the way it works. Um, so just think about how you can help out the journalist by making sure that a lot of people are going to read whatever you're giving them. Third thing is jaded. So, I think tech journalists are a little bit like um, restaurant critics. So restaurant critics get to go and eat in you know, one and two Michelin star restaurants all the time. So the same way tech journalists, we get to use all the latest technology, we get to meet like the CEOs of all these amazing companies. Um, so in order to grab our attention, then you have to have something surprising or delightful. So if you're not gonna get us page views, then the other way to get coverage is to surprise and delight us, to get us really excited about what you're doing. Um, because then you get over the hurdle of jaded. 
And then the final one is follow the crowd. So exactly in the same way that your first customer is always the most difficult customer to get, also your first press coverage in a well-known publication is going to be your most difficult. Because the first thing I will do when I, I'm writing a story is I will actually look at the previous coverage. So not only does that mean that somebody else has verified that this is a company worth writing about, so I don't have to think about it so much, but also journalists are usually better at writing about stuff than the companies themselves. So I will get a better description of what a company does from what another journalist has written than I will from the website. So of course I'm going to look at the website as well, but that means that if you have previous coverage, it's much easier to get more coverage, but not for exactly the same story. Uh, so we also always want something new. We want something different. We want something that hasn't been published on any, any other publication. But if you have previous coverage, that's going to help. So when you're trying to get media coverage, and uh, maybe you're, this is the first time you've tried to do this, um, the combination that's going to work is what I call the Chanel model. So the two C's of Chanel, content and contacts. So it's possible to get coverage with only one of these. If you have a really amazing product and you have no pro contacts, then you may be able to get some journalists excited about what you're doing and therefore you'll get coverage. Or sometimes if you don't have a lot of content, but maybe you have contacts, maybe your investors are very well connected so they can like talk to some journalists and whatever, then maybe you can also get coverage. But that's the kind of stuff you see in TechCrunch that you're reading and you're going, why are, they, why are they writing about this? Because this isn't very interesting. So that's the um, heavy on the context, not so good on the content. And ideally you want to have both. So if you, you should try and leverage any contact you have who might have um, and be able to give you an intro to a journalist and who is trusted by that journalist. And actually that is what PR firms do. So one of the most common questions I get is like, should you hire a PR firm? And we'll get into that one later. But the best ones sometimes can give you those contacts and that's really what you're paying them for. If you only remember one thing that I said today about how to, how to pitch to the tech press, then I hope it's this. A good startup is not a good story. So there's a difference between a, business, a good business and a good story. And when you're pitching to investors, which is usually what startups are doing when they're pitching, they're pitching a business. So they're, they're pitching something which is going to make money for that investor. When you're pitching to a journalist, they don't care so much about how you, whether you're going to make money or not. They care about, is this an interesting story that my readers are going to read, and am I excited about it, and do I want to re write about it? Um, so you have to give, you have to pitch in a different way. You have to think differently about how you're going to talk about your company and what your company is doing in order to get a journalist interested. So a few tricks. Um, one thing which can make your product more interesting is what we call a story angle. So to give you a good example, um, there was a video forensics technology coming out of Iceland. Very interesting technology but you don't just want to write a description of a technology, right? It's, it's interesting, but okay, it's not really a story. The story is how Interpol is using that video analysis technology within their child sex exploitation database in order to link cases together and actually to find perpetrators. That's a story, right? So the second one, you're thinking, oh yeah, actually I want to read about that. First one, not so much. So it's the same product, right? It's the same technology, but you can make it interesting by taking a different angle on it. Another trick is the news hook. So journalists also are often asking the question, why should we write a bit about this now? So even if what you have is very interesting in some way, why are we writing about it now? Um, so in the panel yesterday, if any of you were here then, I gave the example of one of my own articles where I wrote about uh, a company called Bot and Dolly, which makes uh, basically programs industrial robots to film movies. Um, and they filmed the movie Gravity, and, but I wrote about them maybe a year before Gravity came out. So very interesting technology, but they wouldn't let me mention the name of the film. And anyway, nobody knew what Gravity was at that stage because it was a year before it came out. So the article was not, it was okay, it was not that popular. But then a year later, everybody was talking about Gravity because it had just been released. So we took exactly the same article, we put a different headline on it, so we said these are the robots that filmed Gravity, and then that was the top story that day. So it's exactly the same content, but it has a news hook, and that is the difference a news hook can make. 
And then the other thing to think about is that there are different types of article. And maybe if your company is not suitable for one, it will be suitable for another. So straight news is, okay, what happened when, who? You know, company launched product, company got investment, whatever. Analysis is why. Why did company get investment? Why did company get acquired? Um, who was involved? What was going on behind the scenes? And then you have opinion. So why I think company got acquired, because I'm somebody in the same industry. Um, How-tos can be very useful ones. So if you're working in a particular niche, let's say you're, uh, you're a new startup and you're using some, I don't know, new uh, software platform that is not very commonly used, or you're using some new software me uh, development methodology which is not really widespread yet. What can be very useful for you to pitch is a how-to. So you can say, okay, this is what we've learned from using this new platform, or this is what we've learned from using this new methodology, because that is useful information to probably the audience of a lot of tech blogs. So in that way, you are talking about your company without directly talking about your company. You're actually talking about your expertise, and that's a lot of what you're selling with your company. And then features are more like stories, really compelling stories which involve technology. So the one I talked about with Interpol, for example, that's, that's a feature. So also think about which type of story you could pitch and that is going to be suitable for the publication that you're aiming for. And this is just a reading list of some extra stuff, so I, I will ask the, um, the organizers to send this out. So I have an article called How to Pitch to Tech Journalists, which has a lot of this stuff in it as well. <clears throat> or my editor at Fast Company actually wrote one of the best articles that I've seen on this, which is how to pitch your tech project to us. Um, so they're worth reading. And then that's it. So we've got, I think, three minutes left for questions, if anybody wants to ask questions. Ooh. Fantastic. Questions? Last row. Oh, the last row is live. Good. I like it. Microphone, who will be the first? Hi. Um, you didn't take questions in your first presentation, so can I ask something about that? Sure. Okay, I'm wondering, like, should, the, should software be eating the world? More <laughs> like that, you know? Well, and, uh, it's a good question. I mean, it's the, it's the second part, you know? If it's yes, then how should the balance be, you know? because. People can change as fast as the technology is advancing. Well, I suppose it, it, has or it is already eating the world, so we probably can't really stop that process. But that's what I meant by humanification. So we can at least try and make technology that adapts to us and that is serving us, really, rather than creating technology whose rules we have to obey rather than the other way around. Okay. Did, did you get your answer? So, so, one sub question. <laughs> oh, well, because what you're asking is can we roll back the last 10 years of the internet, which we probably can't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you choose, if like, if you take, I mean, innovation shouldn't be limited, but you know, too much innovation is harming. Yeah, I agree. So then I think we need to push back with some of the things that I mentioned in the presentation, like this humanification, or like thinking about ethics and software so that, you know, we, we counteract the fact that companies are gathering all this data on us. Um, or like another trend I mentioned yesterday is this no data, so that it will, it will become a selling point for tech companies that they don't gather data on you, so that they will, if they can provide a really good service and not store all this data about you, then that will actually become a selling point. And who will implement this? Okay, there, we have uh, another question here, so. Basically all of you. Yeah, Goran, yeah, there in the middle. Hello, Goran, CEO of Visor. Uh, my question is, is there any value in mass distribution services uh, like PR web? Because I think you talked more about one-to-one -to, -one to journalists. Oh, uh, you mean press releases? Press release distribution services, okay. like PR way or? To be honest, I never write from a press, the only reason I ever write from a press release is if I'm already interested in the, in the company anyway and the story. And then the press release is just a really good, sum, or should be, a really good summary of, of what is actually being announced. But I very rare, I mean, it's different for different journalists, but I very rarely write something directly from a press release just because I saw the press release. 
Oh yeah. So yes, there, but there are journalists who do. So for that reason, it can be useful because you can get to a lot of different publications at the same time. But really, if you want to get coverage, you want to target some specific journalists before the press release goes out because the problem with the press release is everybody gets it at the same time and everybody will want something before the press release goes out if it's an interesting story. So you should try and target a few journalists first that you think will be friendly and will be interested a few days before and then you send out your mass press release to everybody else. Okay, perfect. Is there, our more? List, yes. uh, is there a list so that I could know which kind of persons should I contact? Um, well, most of these... Um, like Business Wire and whatever, they have particular circuits that you can ask for. So you can ask for the tech circuit or you can ask for the West of the US or whatever. I'm not an expert on this because I'm not in PR. But uh, you can actually target certain types of publication in certain countries and so on. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, one really, really quick question. Okay, there, in front of you. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, what would be the difference to, uh, with contacting local press or global press? Because locally you can make, maybe make one-on-one -on -one contact with a journalist, but how do you make things work globally? Um, well, as Shira mentioned yesterday as well, Twitter is really good. Um, and, and trying to actually develop a relationship with a journalist before you actually pitch something. Um, but if you can, if you can, actually the best is always one-to-one. -one. So events are really good for that, so big conferences, because there's loads of journalists there and they're looking for stories. So if you can, without harassing them, if you can actually track down some relevant journalists at an event, that's usually a really good way to do it. Perfect. One big applause. Thank you very much.